Thank you, Donald. Well, you've been in the news, haven't you? Sacking the director of the FBI. Wow. But we're not discussing that tonight because we're talking about the UK general election. And today has been Education Day. And Labour trying to get on the front foot in this campaign, pledging to spend an extra £20 billion on education over the course of the next few years. The Liberal Democrats pledging an extra £7 billion. And the Conservatives saying... Spending is at record levels, but we can't go on spending money like this, and we're going to have to make some savings over the course of the last, next few years. And UKIP saying, well, actually, it's all about numbers, and that's what's caused the crisis. And numbers, it seems to me, are actually at the heart of this political debate. The fact there are half a million children being taught in class sizes over 30 is being taken by people in politics to be a bad thing. And I wonder... Is it impossible to teach kids well if a class size is 33 as opposed to 25? I don't know. I've got little experience myself of the education system other than having just about stumbled through it myself. So I'm I'm very keen to know uh, from you, you know, let's say you're in charge of education. How would you spend the money? What would you do with the money? And if you're a parent um, and, and maybe your school really is suffering from a lack of money, well, let me know. Call me on 0345 60 60 973. Perhaps you're a teacher and think, you know, money alone isn't the solution. There are other things we can do to improve the education system. Well, text me on 84850. And you may well think uh, that actually we need a lot more money because if the population's going to rise the way that it is, actually we can't think about about cutting spending. We can't even think about increasing it a small amount. Maybe we're going to need a lot of money over the course of the next few years. And if that's how you feel, tweet Farage and LBC at LBC. You can watch the show live on Facebook. Um, and I'm going to go to Tim in Leeds. Tim, you know, is your school well-funded, underfunded? What problems does it have? Uh, it, it's colossally funded, Nigel. Is Absolutely it? colossally funded. And, and, and I, do, I say that as someone who... Well, it's an inner city academy. I, I'm not a UKIP supporter. I'm not trying to f- flatter the ego here, but it, it's colossally funded. Yeah, it has a high proportion of pupil premium children. Right, and so as far as you're concerned, from what you can see of the education system, cash yeah. isn't the problem. Are there other problems that you can see within the system? Well, it's more to do with the culture, I think, and people taking some, and families and children taking some form of responsibility of their own education. But if, can I give you an example, Nigel? Do. Uh, <clears throat> we've been told that there isn't, there's no longer a budget in our department for uh, paper and books. It's all gone, so we have to make do with what we've got. We're not allowed to order any more. But in the same breath, we've just had a private... Well, we have, as, as we speak, actually, a private company in delivering um, uh, a, a, an intense course, they call it, to to year 11s in, you know, who, are, who are approaching their GCSEs in English and mathematics. And that has cost um, £6,000 per subject. But right. we found the money for that. Right. And yet these, these, these kids have had since um, year nine, so effectively nearly three years, preparing them for their GCSEs. Should, t- Tim, should the emphasis in the modern world be, and you mentioned it, books and paper, Or should the emphasis be more for laptops and online learning and online teaching? I don't think it has to be one or the other, to be honest, Nigel. I I think what you need, actually, is is if you need books for a reason, so the kids have something to write on. Uh, And you need laptops and computers for for different things, you know, for research and and for project-based work. But but the the waste in the system is, is... Catastrophic. Um, we have in a school near, near, near nearby. There are four um, managers in the school, who all of whom earn over a hundred thousand pounds. What in one school? Yeah, four four in one school and what? over one hundred thousand pounds. And none of them. Listen to this. None of them teach. Goodness me! Are you absolutely sure of those facts, Tim? A hundred percent. Yeah. Wow. Yeah, there's no, no, it's, it's well noted, actually. Wow, that is unbelievable, because I've heard similar criticisms of the National Health Service, which is, you increase the budget, 
But actually, such a huge chunk of it gets swallowed up in management as opposed to healthcare. And you're kind of saying that from what you can see in your part of Yorkshire, there's something like this happening within the education system. Yeah, and it's, it's not necessarily a personal criticism of those managers. I, 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 you know, they, they do run the school, but you go into a school to teach, they should be teaching and not being paid that much. It's it colossal well, amounts of money. I guess you need a bit of both, Tim, but to think there are four uh, teachers in, in, in a school earning that kind of money, I'm pretty amazed. Tim, thank you. So Tim says he doesn't see funding as being a problem at all, and I'm asking the question, you know, all the politicians are saying... We need to spend this money to reduce class sizes. And I'm asking the question, do class sizes of themselves constitute the problem? And I got a very interesting text in here from Julia in the West Midlands who says, in the 1950s and 60s, we had 40 to 45 in our classes. We had one teacher, no assistant. Yes, they did stand at the front of the class. We sat in rows facing them. And we had stronger, better teachers. Well... That's obviously quite subjective, but Julia makes the point that actually uh, people got a very good education in class sizes, perhaps bigger than some of the ones we have today. I don't know. Judy in Brentwood, uh, you know, you're in charge of the education budget. Do you need more money? How would you spend it? No, I don't need more money. I just need some sense. Right. There were 53 in my class. 53? There were 53 and everybody behaved. We had one child who was slightly backward. He did not have an extra person in there, and he did very well. I have recently helped, or a while ago, in two schools. Do you know you cannot speak to a child and, and rebuke him in any way? They are climbing on the ceiling some of the time, and the whole class is taken out while somebody, the headmistress, got down on her knees and said to this child, what made you want to hit that child? And the whole class has been marched out to the, cl- the playground while we wait. I, I once said to a child, now, when I asked him to do something, I was rebuked roundly. You never say that to a child. No, but maybe, I mean, Judy, when you were at school, perhaps, I mean, I, I'm, I'm, I'm don't, I don't want to prejudge your age. It's always a risky thing to do. But perhaps they had things like corporal punishment at school and... and, no, and we no, we didn't have any of that. You didn't, didn't have any of that, right? We didn't have any of that. I've never known a child. You might have to go and stand outside the headmistress's room, yep. and that was a bad enough thing, but nobody, nobody had any of that problem. But you did what you were told because, you, you know, that's how it was. We did what we were told. So you think the culture has broken down in schools? That's, totally. That's what you're totally. arguing. So it's not about money, it's about the culture within schools, is what Judy thinks. Judy, 53. Where was that, Judy? It was in Merton Park. Merton Park. In Wimbledon. 53 in a class. Wow. Any advance on 53? Judy, thank you for your call. Um, I'm going to ask Jack in Guildford, is it all about money, or is there something more fundamental here that should be being debated during this general election campaign? There's something far more fundamental, and... I'll give you an example. When I was 18 years old, I was psych- psychometrically tested. Yeah. And one of the one of the things they came out and said, I ought to be a journalist. Well, I, I didn't get enough grades to go to journalism college, so hence I didn't go. But I think that personally, where, where children, I mean, some children uh, go to university and what have you, fine, great, carry on. But everybody's got a natural ability and I think we ought to be spending money up. Where that on phone keeps children, on going, Jack, doesn't it? Uh, spending money on children to be psychometrically tested to find out what their natural ability is that they may not even know they've got. Yeah, I mean, I agree with that. Get people doing things they're good at. It was interesting. I was at a big conference this morning up in Manchester, and we were talking about... Um, the room was full of employers, and we were talking about what does the education system need to do to help employers. And what came screaming back at me was that once people have left at 18 and gone to university, actually there are too few people doing, at degree level or at genuine apprentice level, science, technology, engineering or medicine. Um, and, and, And Jack, your point that finding out what people have an aptitude for is actually perhaps one of the most important things people can leave school at 18 with. Um, Jack, do you do you feel the education system works today or not? No. Simple as that. Simple as no, that. I, I think it's, it's, it, all the teachers are, are university graduates where basically you're, you're taught to have a view but not to listen. 
So, so I mean, the children are pushed in a direction. And then what's the point if a child has got a natural aptitude towards metalwork but doesn't realise it, what's the point in t- teaching them how to cook boiled eggs? Well, no, fine. And maybe, Jack, what's the point of making kids stay on at school till they're 18 when actually by the age of 15 some of them are utterly disinterested in academic work and they might be better getting some vocational experience from an earlier age? Or finding out what their natural ability is and pushing them in that direction and they can discover it themselves. Yeah. Jack, I thank you for your point. I wonder, perhaps, perhaps the national curriculum is a good thing in one way in that it makes sure that everybody is learning roughly the same thing. I wonder whether, with this system of the national curriculum, we actually find out other aptitudes that perhaps people may have. Adam in Highbury, um, class sizes, do they really matter? Well, I think that they do, because if you have a large class size, you end up with, um, you know, the more prominent students uh, talk um, more, more often and will get more engaged with the class. Uh, those who are more confident, whereas children who perhaps don't have that confidence at that point but still have an interest in learning all of that don't get, don't engage. The teachers don't engage with them, and so they sort of get left behind in a way. Yeah, that may be true. That may be true. So, Adam, again, you're another caller who is not saying that it's all about money, and yet our political leaders are having a, a slugging it out predominantly over money. But you don't believe that's at the root of this, do you? Uh, I, to, to a degree, not. Um, I mean, I think it's similar to uh, other areas of um, uh, national spending, uh, like the NHS, where yep. there are issues where there isn't enough money being spent, but at the same time, they need to reorganise the way in which the system is uh, provided to people. So, yes, I do think there is a problem with spending in general anyway, but that's a problem that we just don't have the money to provide. However, um, we also need to look at how, this, uh, how we provide these uh, services in any case. I mean, one thing, for instance, is the provision of grammar schools, where, yep. again, you are able then to reach pupils who have an aptitude for the academic subjects, and therefore you can divide it that way without necessarily needing to spend more. You just need you know, a blackboard and a teacher or whatever. Um, if you get people taught in the correct way for the correct um, uh, subjects that they have a natural attitude towards, you can then divide those class sizes down into actually targeting people towards what they're... And good the right, at. And, and the right subjects, yeah. finding out what people really like and what they're good at, as Jack said before. Adam, I thank you, and I've no doubt we'll get some calls on grammar schools, because that is a divide in this campaign, that Theresa May does want to bring back a larger number of grammar schools. That pleases me, but please, tell me I'm wrong. Tell me the Prime Minister's wrong. Tell me I'm wrong about class sizes. Tell me, actually, we need to have smaller class sizes or we can't teach kids properly. Right now, you're listening to The Nigel Farage Show, exclusively on RBC. It's 7.15. Yeah, I'm concerned about the security and terrorism. Stability, really, I think, in the country. Education is very important. NHS. It's the battle for number 10, and for the first time in this election, I'll be putting your questions to the party leaders fighting for your vote. LBC's Leaders Live. First up for the Conservatives, Theresa May. Well, I'll be setting out, I think, to the LBC listeners why I think this election is so important. Join me, Nick Ferrari, tomorrow night from 7. Britain decides. Follow the general election from every angle on LBC. The election starts now. It's not good news. It is cancer. When you walk through a storm, hold your head up high. And don't be afraid of the dark. Walk on. Walk on. Come on, walk on. With hope in your heart, Dad. No one facing cancer should walk alone. We are Macmillan Cancer Support. We've been thinking about pruning. Not your peonies or your privet, but your cost of living. And how, from broadband to mobile phones, these days we're all looking for ways to trim our spending. And then we thought, couldn't we help you cut back on your biggest outgoing? And we thought, yes, we could. So we'll always try to help you remortgage to a better rate and save on your monthly repayments. Mortgages for how life is now. NatWest. We are what we do. Your home may be repossessed if you do not keep up repayments on your mortgage. Divorce. It affects every part of your life. You, your family, your home, your finances. 
And if you're a man facing divorce, perhaps even one you don't want, the situation becomes even more complicated. It's at times like these that you need a professional you can trust. Cordell & Cordell is dedicated to helping men in matters relating to divorce. Call now on 0330-6060-161 or visit cordellcordell.co.uk, office in central London. A partner men can count on. Don't ignore the... It's the law to have a work... Don't ignore the workplace pension. Get to know your responsibilities with help from the pensions regulator. Visit workplacepensions.gov.uk. Landlords, Direct Line guarantees to be other insurers' renewal premiums for the same cover. Can your insurance do that? Switch to Direct Line Landlord. New customers only, qualifying criteria apply. Underwritten by UK Insurance Limited. We've got it at Selco. Selco is where the trade goes. At Selco Builders Warehouse, we've got real deals on a wide range of trade quality building products. In May, we've got 125 by 18 millimeter solid oak rustic lacquered flooring for only £20.95 XVAT per square meter. Now that's a real deal. We've got even more real deals and thousands of products in stock at the massive new Selco Builders Warehouse on Slyfield Industrial Estate, Guildford. Selco is where the trade go. Should testing a mattress for 30 seconds really inform a 10-year investment? Hi, I'm Neil, one of the co-founders of Casper. We make a single perfect mattress and let you sleep on it for 100 nights to decide if you like it. The Casper mattress was awarded at Which Best Buy of 2017. It's manufactured in Greater Manchester and ships in a compact box. Try it for 100 nights, risk-free. If you don't like it, we'll pick it up and give you a full refund. Visit Casper.com and use code CHOICE to get 50 pounds towards your mattress. Terms and conditions apply. That's code CHOICE at Casper.com. The Nigel Farage Show on LBC. Call 0345 6060 973. Education, it's all the rage, and we're being told by political leaders that it's all about money. So far, not a single caller has said the problem is a lack of funding. But there is great pressure on the education system. And, you know, I've sort of asked the question, does a class size of 33 mean kids get taught far worse than a class size of 25? Numbers per class have gone up, but equally, the number of classes has gone up. And what has put pressure on the education system is just the simple arithmetic. There are 470,000 more pupils in the school system than there were in 2009. That's pretty remarkable, isn't it? And the projection is that we're going to need to actually provide an extra 750,000 school places by 2025. And I remember in the last election, making the point that how on earth could you plan for what future school provision and school building you would need when you had no idea how many people were coming into the country? And I was screamed at and shouted at and told, no, 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 this debate has nothing to do with immigration at all. Well, the official 2015 figures, which is the last year we've got, show that minority ethnic pupils made up 71% of the increase in that year. Now, I'm not arguing this is a good thing or a bad thing, but I am arguing that actually the sheer number of people coming into this country every year, the age of people coming into this country every year, means that we have got more and more births uh, per annum, and by the time we get to five years old, there is massive pressure now, particularly on our primary school system. So they're the facts, and, and, and actually, you can... And, and I've tried to be... As, as apolitical as I can about that, uh, but I do think our politicians, our leaders, have been guilty of turning a complete blind eye to the link between opening up our borders and what we need to provide in terms of public services. And if you think I'm completely wrong about that, then do, do tell me, please. I'm going to go to Guy in Stoke-on-Trent. Is it about money? Is it about class sizes? Tell me, Guy, what's your view? Well, I was going to ask you, Nigel, um, what typically would we find class sizes in a public school? Because I had no idea. I wonder if you knew. Well, I do know, Guy, and you know that I know. Uh, when I was in the junior bit of the school, uh, our class sizes were about 28 to 30. About 28 to 30, and then as we got older and as we broke down into individual sub, uh, subjects, depending whether they were popular or not, by A-level, uh, general... Not mind you, I did spend a bit of time at the Oval watching Cricket Guy, to be honest with you, but, but by the time A-level a came along, uh, we would have been in sets then of about 18 to 20, I would say. 
And that was at a public school? It was, yeah. Um, so, but you're advocating that school sizes aren't relevant to the quality of education. Well, what, what I'm arguing, Guy, is that we have a huge extra number of people we have to teach every single year. So we have to build new schools, we have to have more classes. The question I was, and I, the question I was asking was, if a class size is 33, does that mean the children in that class get taught very much worse than if it's 25? Well, I'm proposing that the answer to that, quest- the answer to that question is in the private school, which is called the public school, yeah. in that they must have low they must have a low student to teacher ratio because it um, it um, it um, encourages good results. If it didn't, surely as a business they would double the amount of students per teacher, and they would either make more money or they could charge less school fees. Guy, I completely understand that if you're particularly particularly, I would suspect, later on in the education system, um, that, that clearly the ratio of teachers to students does make a huge difference. Wh- whether, and I, again, and please tell me I'm wrong, whether at the age of seven or eight, a class size of 25 to 33 makes a huge difference, I don't know, is the answer. Well, Nigel, <clears throat> look, I aren't an academic, and I aren't particularly well-educated, but I believe that the best schools are in Scandinavia. So it isn't difficult to go and see how they how they achieve such excellent results for their children at schools. That, and I thought that was the solution. Go and investigate well, a series of countries yeah. who do it well. And, and, and the other point, Guy, that you raised in this call that I think is worth making is that the 7% of people in this country whose parents are well off enough to send them to private schools now, I think, have a bigger advantage over those going to state schools than they've ever had, uh, certainly in modern times. And there is perhaps, Sky, something fundamentally wrong with that. Well, yeah, I'd agree with you there, absolutely. And, and as, as a, a, a child coming from a poorer family, the introduction of tuition fees at university has made it even more difficult to, yes. uh, to get educated. As, as, as a, I'm sure when you went to uni, you didn't have tuition fees. Well, I didn't go, Guy. I wasn't good enough. But, but, but you're right, um, you know. Uh, but also, Guy, you know, out of my age bracket, about 12% of my age bracket went to university. Now it's about 45%, I think. So we're sending a lot of people to university who, in my view, probably are not benefiting uh, from coming out with a degree that doesn't help them in the workplace, that gives them a load of debt, whilst at the same time there may be people from poorer families scared of racking up that amount of debt who perhaps ought to be going. So I do think, Guy, there is reform that we need within the education system. I, I personally think grammar schools do offer bright kids from poorer backgrounds a real chance to get on, and I know that's highly contentious, and I guess we'll get some calls in a minute telling me that I'm wrong, uh, but I, Guy, I take the view that this is not just about money. That's my opinion. What do you think to that? Um, I think money is one of the prime issues. In it's it. part of it, um, yeah. yeah. I, it, like that, I, <clears throat> I think it's an important issue. Yeah. yeah um, no, Guy, no one's going to deny that it's important, but it's, I, I'm not sure that it's the be-all and end-all. But listen, Guy, I thank you for the conversation. I thank you for your call. A radical idea comes in on Twitter. How about parents actually pay towards the cost of education? Why should it be free? Parents need to put their hands in their pockets. I think that one uh, is going to probably go down like a lead balloon. Um, I remember large auditoriums of students, and that was accepted. It's not the class size that matters. It's the attitude of the kids and the teachers. Nigel, we need teachers who can actually teach at an academic level, at all levels, root out the politically motivated mentors. There was a Pink Floyd song about that, wasn't there? I seem to remember. Um, Ken in Enfield. Is it all about money? Is it about class sizes? Or or actually, given the population increase, are we going to need to spend a lot more money over the next few years? I'm 19 uh, next birthday. 19? When I left school at 14, I went to evening classes for 20 years. And all the guys that were in engineering all around me were all quite ordinary people, and not a penny piece was spent very much on their education. They just had a burning desire to learn and a burning desire to work, not just to hang about in classrooms wasting their time. So, Ken, when you left at 14, 
Yeah. What, what were your literacy and numeracy skills li- uh, like? Um, well, what what can you say? I, I, I mean, I, I, up to the age it, it was the wartime uh, yep. when I was eleven. So the the educational system collapsed, and I was evacuated to Cookham. Yeah. The teachers came down with us, and then when I went to work, I, I sort of. Nobody took any nose of me, and I wasn't particularly sort of bothered about anything in particular except that I wanted to become an electrical engineer. So I went to evening classes and had day releases in those days. But, of course, the whole structure in engineering then was on self-made people, like there is in motorsports today. In motorsports today, the British are, are, are supreme because very many of them are not particularly qualified but they can stick their cars together with chewing gum, as it were. <laughs> Kent, should we be encouraging more young people to take up vocational training earlier? Yes, I think you should leave them alone. I think you should leave them... I, I was completely left alone. And my education was self-educated, um, in, in so far as the fact I was interested in the Renaissance and all that sort of thing. So, And I listened to uh, Radio 3 at the time, and I had a... Uh, an education which came at me in drips. Yeah, 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 yeah. Okay, very good, Ken. Interesting. Ken left school at 14 and doesn't seem to have done too badly. Gordon says on Facebook, there were 35 kids in my class and I turned out all right. Never did me any harm. Jackie says in the 60s, there were always 30 plus kids in the classes. We were taught well. Trouble is now there's no discipline. Alice says, my school had funding. I left with no GCSEs, but I do have an honours degree. I think that makes you a late developer. Linda says, I had teachers that put the fear of God up us. Well, do we want, actually, to terrify our younger generation? I don't know. It's the battle for number 10 this week, and tomorrow Nick Ferrari is going to be putting your questions live to the Prime Minister, Theresa May, at 7 o'clock in this slot. It's going to be fascinating. It's her first live of the campaign. And at 7.30, I will come back into this, into this chair and for an hour and a half get your immediate reaction to what the Prime Minister said to Nick Ferrari. Nick, who I think is becoming the most feared interviewer in the British media, because whenever he asks questions, they all seem to stumble and have a terrible problem. You're listening to The Nigel Farage Show, exclusively on LBC. It's 7.30 and time for the news with Rupert Bartia. Three women have been charged with planning a terror attack and conspiracy to murder. They were detained after a police raid at a property in northwest London last month and are due in court tomorrow. It's reported that in the last few days, James Comey requested more money and manpower for his investigation into links between Donald Trump's team and Russia. He was fired as director of the FBI last night. President Trump says it's because he wasn't doing a good job. And the Crown Prosecution Service has announced that no criminal charges will be brought over the Conservatives' general election expenses in 2015. LBC weather. Mostly dry and clear into the evening. Some rain possible in the far north, a low of 8 Celsius. Tomorrow, rain in southern parts, otherwise staying dry, a high of 21 degrees. LBC Travel. Good evening. I'm Andy Lake. In South London, the South Circular remains closed between Shooters Hill in Eltham and Academy Road in Woolwich after a serious accident, causing queues back to the A2. Into Essex, the A127 South End Arterial Road is blocked eastbound to deal with a collision just before the A128 at Halfway House. There are bad delays now on the approach, which will affect you heading towards the coast from the M25 to Basildon. In Essex, elsewhere, the M25 looking heavy anti-clockwise just after Junction 27 to the M11 because of a breakdown in the inside lane. In the West Midlands, the M42 is slow northbound between Junction 5 for Solihull and Junction 6 for the A45 at Coventry. The outside lane of 4 there was closed, but it is now open. And on the rails, Virgin Trains East Coast have delays of around 15 minutes between King's Cross and Grantham. For more real-time traffic updates, go to lbc.co.uk. This is LBC. Good morning, Swale Heating. My boiler's died. Well, I've just survived a cold shower. Oh dear, well, we can help. At Swale Heating, our expert engineers can install a brand new A-rated Worcester Bosch boiler with a warranty of up to 10 years and one year's free cover for the whole central heating system, subject to survey. I think the cat's moved out. If necessary, we can get your boiler installed within 48 hours. And the dog's starting to look like an Arctic fox. Rely on us to keep you warm. Visit swaleheating.com today. In Britain, transit means business. Business for... And... Or, and at your local transit show live, it means money-saving business. 
Visit your nearest participating Ford dealer between the 13th and 21st of May, take a test drive, and you'll save £500 on selected new Ford commercial vehicles. Ford, go further. To qualify for the additional £500 customer saving off the recommended retail price of selected new Ford commercial vehicles, you must test drive any new Ford commercial vehicle between the 13th and 21st of May 2017. Contract between 13th and 21st of May 2017. Register between 13th of May and 31st of December 2017. At participating dealers only, exclude Ranger XL and XLT models. Oh, the garden's an absolute mess. It's my turn to have the cross-stitch crew round for tea and Battenberg. I'll have to get a landscape gardener in. And a wildlife expert. It's a jungle out there. We could be eaten alive by those deadly flutterbugs. Oh, relax, relax. It's Trust a Trader. Marvellous local tradespeople who've been tried, tested and reviewed. All specialists in their areas, from landscape gardening to pest control. Oh, visit trustatrader.com. Trust Leading Britain's conversation, LBC, The Nigel Farage Show. Well, the great expenses row of 2015 has really come fully to a head today. Um, as you may remember, there was a big battle bus, stuffed full of activists that would tour around the country for the Conservative Party, going to their target seats. And by all account, after a hard day's campaigning, they'd, they'd, they'd have a hard night's partying. The question was if they were turning up in, in constituencies to canvass and campaign for individual men and women for the Conservative Party, that should have been added to the expenses of the constituency campaign as opposed to the national campaign. Yeah, I know it's a bit technical, but there is something called the law. Anyway, today, the Crown Prosecution Service have said that no Conservative politicians will face criminal charges following investigations into how the spending was recorded. The CPS say there is not enough evidence to prove dishonesty. The Conservative Party says it proves their candidates did nothing wrong and the Prime Minister did her best today to try to draw a line under it. What the, the CPS has decided, they're an independent body, they have decided that no charges will be brought against any candidate in relation to this matter. Uh, candidates did nothing wrong. This is a, very important, I repeat that, I've said it now several times, candidates did nothing wrong. Well, t the Lib Dems, Tim Farron, was, to say mildly, rather disappointed. It's a shame, in one sense, that uh, it would appear there's a cloud hanging over British politics, indeed this election, that seems to indicate that those with the most money and the biggest war chests are uh, given an advantage rather than those who have the best arguments. And Jeremy Corbyn says he was surprised at the decision. The CPS is independent, the Electoral Commission is independent, and I think you have to accept that because politicians should not be interfering with the judicial process. That's why we have a separation of powers between the judiciary and the political systems. So I'm making no further comments on it. I've been worried about spending and, con and conduct, not just in general elections, but in by-elections, actually for many, many years now. It seemed uh, that the law simply, to me, simply wasn't being applied properly. Uh, in this case, was today a total whitewash? Well, the party did get fined previously by the Electoral Commission, so I would say at least something has been done, at least a marker of some kind. Uh, has been put down. Now, I said no Conservative politicians will face charges. There is one exception uh, to today's announcement, and there is a delay, and it's on a Kent constituency, and guess who stood there in the 2015 general election? Yes, it was me. And as yet, we have no decision as to whether they're going to press or not. I really... You know, I was aggrieved personally back in 2015 by the way the whole thing uh, operated. Uh, I, and I suppose I still feel that to this day. Uh, so whether, whether in that one remaining case some serious action is taken or not, I best, for the moment, not say any more. But believe me, when the CPS give their final judgment, I might have quite a lot to say. That aside, it's been Education Day and... It seems to be a big battle between the party leaders about how much money is needed. So far, I've not had a single caller or text or tweet or Facebook message telling me that the school their kids are at is in a disastrous plight because they haven't got enough money. So if you're out there and if underfunding really is the problem, do let me know. And I'm not pretending it doesn't matter. Of course it matters. I mean, we spend... £40 billion pounds every year 
on education. It's a lot of money. Mind you, peanuts to the European Union, isn't it? Because they want £85 billion for us to leave. Well... I'd rather spend two years in education, wouldn't you? I wonder, Stephen Carl Schulzen, you're in charge of education. Is money your first priority? What else would you do? Uh, I think quant- uh, quality is better than quantity. So uh, the price of education, as long as it's used correctly, is, is the, main po- the main point we, we should be looking at, really. Right. So I, think, I mean, my, my son's in a school of... Uh, uh, a class of seventy with three children, with three uh, teachers, uh, so it works completely different to any other school high school that you've been. How does that work, Steve? So are are all seventy in the room together at, at, at the same yes, time? All together, all together at the same time. Uh, that, that's called, that's what they call a school. Yeah, uh, there's three schools, uh, all with around about seventy in, with three teachers each. Right, uh, and, and that teacher doesn't just teach one subject. It teaches everything barring uh, maths, science, English, and music. Okay, and does it work, Steve? Uh, in my opinion, he's only in year seven, but I don't think it is going to work. You don't think it is? I, I don't think it's going to work because no no teacher can answer every, uh, uh, all the questions about all the subjects uh, in depth enough for, for the children right. to learn. Well, that sounds, Stephen. By the way, your phone line is rotten. But that sounds—I I, I have to say—I've not heard of a case of the, the, the concept of seventy of them together and three teachers. Sounds very different, very strange to me. June in Liverpool. June, I believe you're a teacher. Uh, yes, that's right, Nigel. Good evening. So tell me, Good evening. tell me, what are the problems in your school? Okay, um, you've, you've said about pe- nobody's phoned in to talk about funding being an issue. Well, I'm, I'm going to book that trend because funding is absolutely a horrendous issue across okay. um, a lot of schools in the North West. Yep. Um, I think it's absolutely inconceivable that nobody, is, uh, as people are dismissing the fact that funding is completely detrimental to class sizes, because at the end of the day, if funding is cut from schools, like it is being in my school, and I'll tell you about my school in a minute, then we simply cannot afford to employ enough teachers, hence class sizes go up. So we have class sizes going from maybe a nice size of sort of like 20 or 25 students, which is manageable for a teacher. We're looking at 30, 35, 40. And with the best will in the world, even a bionic teacher is going to be unable to ensure that every single student in their class has made progress, every single student understands the concept you're trying to deliver. Um, And it's only going to get worse. In our school, we've already had to lay off support staff, which are vital for those um, special educational needs students or students with additional needs. So they're being disadvantaged already. Um, the Tories proposed um, a new funding um, scheme for school. I think it's called, I think it's called the Fair Funding Policy. Um, I can't quite remember about it. Uh, I'm just so angry right now. Um, basically, by 2019, our school will have lost nearly £700,000 from its budget. Yeah. That's equivalent of 15 members of staff, 15 but, teachers. But June, 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 I mean, I, 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 I understand the, 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 the upset that is coming uh, through on this phone call, and I get it. Um, and clearly... If a class goes from 25 to 40, that does make a difference. And I understand that, and I completely am with you on that. But but I had a phone call at the top of the hour from a gentleman from the north of England who said or claimed that in the school that his children go to, it's obviously a big school, there were four administrators who didn't teach who were all earning over £100,000 a year. I mean, is that where the money's going? Um, obviously, I don't know where this school is. I can't speak for sure, it. Sure, sure. And I'm not sure. I'm not sure. I'm not sure what he means by administrators. He talks about deputy heads. He talks about assistant head teachers. But apart from the head teacher in our school, there is no member of staff that calls himself a teacher that does not teach. And there are no administrators on that sort of money in my school. So right. A, our school is not an academy. Um, it's a true comprehensive school uh, yep. in the north, in the northwest. Um, so if the money is going there, absolutely, that's disgustingly immoral. But the uh, members of staff who are paid the higher wages in our school, sort of going along the pay progression, um, they are the members of staff who are ultimately accountable for results and uh, manage the curriculum, um, manage pastoral issues. So they have they have big weights on their shoulders, but they also teach us a teaching timetable at the same time. Yeah. So it's almost doing the jobs of three so, people so, at once. So June, your your school numbers are going up every year, yeah. Yeah, in line. Yeah, uh, we're current, we've got two sixty per year group. We're looking to we're having to increase because of um, uh, the population in the area. Having to increase about three hundred yeah. with no extra funding for teachers. Yeah, that sounds very very typical. So June, let's just say that in a few weeks' time you were appointed the education secretary. What would your three 
key priorities for educational oh, spending right. be? That will be quite a promotion. I'm only 26. Well, um, you never know if you, you know, if, you, if you're good enough, you're old enough, you know. Um, well, first of all, I've completely scrapped this grammar school's idea. I think it's absolutely ridiculous. Okay. Personally, if you, if you want to improve the education in this country, why are we not funding schools that are already, you know, outstanding but are really struggling? Or why are we not looking to fund schools that really need a little bit of help? Why are we putting money into these elitist educational establishments? I don't understand it at all. Um... Oh, I can't think. I can't think. All right. Myself. Well, um, June, June, I tell you what. I tell you what. You've made one point and made it very strongly and made it very well. And I can tell that you are a very passionate twenty-six-year-old teacher who cares hugely about what she does. And your phone call has been very valuable. And thank you. Well, that was the first teacher that we've had on. And interesting, isn't it? She says that that, that every year they've been letting in two hundred and sixty pupils. That is now going up to three hundred. So we are a little bit back, aren't we, to this question. Actually, if the school population is increasing at that kind of percentage, you actually, yes, you can be more efficient, but it's quite tough to get away from the fact that the budget is going to have to rise pretty steeply if these trends continue. Uh, But, I mean, please, please, any of you out there, teachers, governors of schools, whoever you are, if it is a funding problem, do, do tell me. John in Preston, good evening. Hello, Nigel. Good. What is your experience of education, John? Uh, well, I've probably been teaching for about six or seven years now. Um, yep. And I've taught at a school of about 13, 1,400 students going up and now another school where we've only got about 200 students. Um, but straight away, I'll say the difference I've seen over the six years that with this class size is changing, you know, I say come from a big school, getting around, say, 30, 33 students in an hour you, you just can't do it. You can't intervene with the students. You can't help them. You can't mark the books. You can't give them feedback. And obviously with Ofsted and the, the rigorous kind of um, changes that have happened, you know, you could argue that actually you're a failing teacher because you can't get around all the students. But the new school that I'm at now, I've got classes for, ranging from about eight students going up to 25. Why is that, John? And are you in the middle of sort of some mountainous district where no one lives? Or, you know, um, what? Well, currently I am actually in the Ribble Valley. But... Um, no, um, I actually teach in what's called a studio school. So we, have right. small, we, we stereotypically have small class sizes. Um, but it's, uh, it's it basically aimed at students basically getting ready for the workplace. Um, so we actually do have longer hours. Um, and we teach subjects that basically are based towards uh, business rather than, um, you know, your theoretical subjects. OK, um, so, you're, so what you're saying, John, is that, that, is that your teaching is more vocational, Yeah. To a degree, yes, but it's the, the big thing for us is the class sizes, and I know this is what else you're going on about. Um, and I say I've come from a school of uh, say of uh, like 33 students in a class. Yeah, and I just you can't get around them, you can't teach them. So what's and the right number, John? Really... What? Sorry. What is the right number? <sighs> well, for my for my very small year, six years of experience, probably say about 20 is incredible. Okay. All right, John, thank you very much for your very, obviously very unique school uh, that John is teaching in. You're listening to the Nigel Farage show exclusively on LBC. It's 7:45. This is LBC. Coming up at 8 on LBC, Clive Bull. Politicians from all parties have signed an open letter to Jeremy Corbyn and Theresa May calling for a fairer voting system. But is there something unfair about first past the post? Clive Bull on LBC. Landlords, Direct Line guarantees to be other insurers' renewal premiums for the same cover. Can your insurance do that? Switch to Direct Line Landlord. New customers only, qualifying criteria apply. Underwritten by UK Insurance Limited. Nobody likes the unknown, especially when it comes to selling your home. So don't choose an estate agent. Choose Property Rescue. They'll simply buy your property direct, which means you could exchange, with money in the bank, in just 48 hours. So, no need to worry about the unknown of selling on the open market. Get that just-sold feeling with Property Rescue. Fast forward to peace of mind at propertyrescue.co.uk. Do you have a pension? Maybe you've got more than one. How do you know if they're in the right pension funds, making as much money as possible for your retirement? Answer is, you probably don't. 
At the Pension Works, our fully qualified independent financial advisors could add instant value to your retirement fund. Simply text the word YES to 8322 for your free Pension Works health check. That's YES to 8322 today. Your pensions working harder with the Pension Works. So what does everybody love about basics from Oasis Dental Care? I love getting affordable private dental care at my local Oasis practice. I love having the treatment I need at a fixed price. I love booking an appointment at a time that suits me. With basics, we're sharing the love at Oasis practices all over the UK. Book a basics checkup now for just £30 at oasisdentalcare.co.uk. What's not to love? Participating practices only. Terms and conditions apply. See website for details. You can earn more with a degree. And you can get a degree in just two years with a course at GSM London. Degrees are awarded by Plymouth University. And if you don't have a formal qualification, you can start on our foundation year. Places are available for June at our Greenford and Greenwich campuses. Enroll now. Text GSM to 66677. Or visit gsmlondon.ac.uk. GSM London. Have bold dreams. Leading Britain's conversation, the Nigel Farage Show. Tweet at LBC using the hashtag Farage on LBC. As soon as you just start discussing education, you get a whole mass of separate arguments going on at the same time. The politicians, the leaders are talking about money. Uh, most of the callers and texters and tweeters are not talking about money. They're mostly talking about the culture within schools. They're talking about discipline within schools. But interesting, isn't it, that it's the teacher or the teachers that ring up who say, actually, funding does matter. We're being asked to teach more and more children in our school every year on a budget that simply isn't working. And how can you teach 35 or 40 kids in a class when actually the last suggestion was that nearer 20 might be the right number. Derek on Facebook says an MP should spend a week in a poor performing school and see what's happening. Derek, for goodness sake, we do not want our politicians going out in the real world and understanding what's going on. No, I agree with you totally. Ben says, wouldn't teachers manage better if we sent all trainee teachers to do two years national service in the military so that they get some real world experience and learn a bit more about discipline? That's exactly what my grandfather would have said, I have to say. He really would. Um, yeah, I don't hear the National Service argument very often, but, but actually there are people out there who think it might be a good for society. Goodness knows, though, how we'd ever afford it. Um, I get um, on Twitter, the problem with education is faith schools promoting segregation from an early age and dividing UK society, says Guy. Yes, Guy, I understand that, but there are some new rules now, aren't there, that actually faith schools have to have, I think it's 15% of other faiths within that school, so that the youngsters growing up do get an understanding there are other points of view and other religion out there. Um, the new generation, Nigel, were born with a laptop or an iPad in their pampers. So times are very difficult now. Discipline is an issue, says Christian. I'm going to ask Sidan in Welling. Uh, class, class sizes, Sidan, how important are they? Uh, good evening. I think I've gone to a state school, private school, and a grammar school. And, right. And, and I'm That's a hat trick. Now. That's a hat trick. How have you managed that, Sidan? Um, so when I. Uh, my parents were immigrants, so uh, my, the first school I went to was a state school, and then I went to a private school for a year, and yeah. then I got into grammar school. Okay. And I've been in a grammar school since. Okay. And yeah. I'm in the I now. Um, and I think the class sizes in each type of school are hugely different, and specifically in my grammar school, the year, the size of the year has gone up from 150 to 327 this year. Wow. And I think that's quite quite a big leap. Wow. Uh, and regardless of the class size, I think. I, I don't think they matter that much, and I think it's down to the students and the quality of teaching. So, um, I mean, typically, typically at your grammar school, and we're not going to highlight which one it is, but at your grammar school, what would the average class size be? Because um, I'm doing, I'm in sixth form now, it yeah. really depends on the subject. That that, I'm yeah, doing. yeah, that, that's um, different. But up to GCSE, what would the class size be? 25. 25. OK, and you and you felt, as a student, that was a, a perfectly workable, sensible number? Um, definitely. Um, I think the teachers sometimes overestimate the work they, they actually need to do. But regardless, <laughs> I think it's 
a motivated student can always do well in their life. I, I think it's what they really want to do. And I've been on a Chinese exchange, and in that I was, uh, I saw what a school like school was there. Yes. Um, and they had fifty students in, in a class, and that was very, very weird to me. And, edu- and, and educationally, they're, they're beginning to conquer the world, aren't they? Yeah, exactly. And that I don't think it makes sense to what you would normally think would happen. Right.、Um, So I think the problem really lies in the quality of teaching.、Um, I'm not saying that there's bad quality of teaching, but in fact, to, to actually improve、uh, education, you can't really control the type of child you have. The thing you can control as a government is the type of teachers you have and the quality of teachers you have. No, but、and、you're a, in order but, to do that. But the thing is, Sudan, you、mm-hmm. have done GCSE. You're doing A level at a grammar school. You obviously are well equipped. To deal with academic study, and you're with people who are in the same bracket. So actually, they're all motivated. They all quite enjoy, in a sense, being at school. And I think maybe the problem is there are quite a lot of people who, at the age of fifteen or sixteen, recognise. Do you know what? I'm no blooming good at this. And that's when you start to get. Maybe that's when you start to get a problem with discipline, a problem with truancy. And I just. I just keep coming back to this. I do understand that money is important. Sit down. Thank you very much for your call. I do understand that money is clearly an issue, but I do just wonder whether there aren't quite a lot of people who are who who actually we're spending money on teaching academic subjects up to the age of eighteen who might be much better off and much happier learning something else. Please tell me I'm an old dinosaur. Tell me I'm wrong, but that is what I think. And when I see when I meet employers. Like I did in the north of England today, who tell me they're struggling to get people who have done science, technology, engineering, or medicine. I begin to think perhaps that point of view is sensible. I'm going to Cromer in Norfolk. Mark, you're on LBC. Hello, good evening,、uh, Nigel. Good、Two、evening. Two quick points, if I may. First、yes. of all, on electoral expenses, which you raised earlier. Yes. Surely it shouldn't matter. There was no intention to deceive or. Be dishonest. What does matter, surely, is that in some constituencies, the result was unfairly influenced. And I don't understand why the election or electoral commission, whatever it's called,、uh, didn't order those elections to be rerun. Do you have a view on that?、Um, I, Mark, I'm sorry to say that since the electoral commission came into being, they haven't succeeded at very much.、Uh, they've overseen the explosion of postal voting fraud and many other things. They've hounded. Literally hounded UKIP almost to try to close it down a few years ago,、uh, and I'm not sure the Electoral Commission are really doing their job, Mark. If you want my honest, honest answer, your honest answer is always welcome.、Um, the second point, yes, education, I, Mark, please. Yes, education. I don't think you need to spend、uh, any money at all. Just keep the current spending going. What you should do, and what has to be done, surely, is to empower principals to sack bad. Teachers, because、yep. we all remember from school those who could teach and those who simply could not. I say, just get rid of the bad ones.、Uh, make it just make it easier to get rid of the bad ones, and you'll you'll see so many much much better results. And, and who would you give that power to, Mark? Purely to the headmasters and headmistresses? Well, I think obviously it, it can't. Be only one person because you might have personal differences,、yeah. uh, which might be exploited. But it, it must surely be a principal and two senior teachers, maybe outside observers. Do you have?、Like、I、that. mean, do you have specific experience of there being bad teachers in schools holding kids back? Well, I, I've seen it from both both sides of the board. So,、um, I went to a grammar school. Yes,、um, and.、Uh, I can remember one bad teacher. Obviously, I won't go into any any details.、Uh, he just couldn't teach. He had a tiny, tiny class size, and all of his kids、uh, failed their A levels in that particular subject. Right.、Um, well, he's, he's long since gone. But from the other point of view, I taught English in Japan, where regularly、wow. had regular classes of forty-seven. That was the norm in this particular school. Yeah. Discipline wasn't an issue,、um, but the teachers were good. I mean, they got results. Um, and it was a private school, and bad teachers simply weren't tolerated. Interesting, Mark. Very interesting. There's good and bad in all walks of life, and yeah, in any job, any profession, if people are failing, there needs to be some mechanism of getting rid of them. Interesting, isn't it? We've had feedback now from China and from Mark, who taught in Japan, class sizes of fifty in parts of the Far East, and yet 
producing amazing, I mean, really quite amazing academic results. Peter, you're the last from Wandsworth. You're the last caller of the night. You've got 40 seconds to make your point. Um, yeah, so hi, Nigel. Hi. First time caller. Um, Welcome. So my main point that I like to make is, obviously, I'm 24 years old, so I've not long left the actual educational system itself. Sure. Um, so I, I actually left the educational system and went straight into a vocational course, which was plumbing. Now, the reason why I did is because I didn't believe in the actual curriculum itself. Yep. Now, the reason, the only way I can really explain that is that you can, you can always get a monkey to climb a tree, and you can always teach a monkey to climb a tree. But if you stick a fish in front of that tree, it's never going to be able to climb that tree no matter how hard you teach it. Right. Um, and that's a fact. Now, it can be taken in the same response to, uh, if you like, a human being. A human being, each individually, can do their own things, and every human being is different to what they can do. So is the national, now, curri- is the national curriculum a bit of a straitjacket, Peter, on youngsters? I believe, that, I believe the national curriculum itself is the only thing... I mean, it hasn't, it hasn't, there hasn't really been no curriculum change inside the, the, inside the scheme itself okay. for the last 40 years. So for the last 40 years, we've, we've been stuck on a very rigid scheme. Peter, um, which... I'm going to have to let you go, Peter. You've made your point beautifully and, and, and with a wonderful example about fish and trees. I shan't forget it. Uh, Peter's point that we're all different and maybe the national curriculum is a straitjacket. Very interesting. Most of you thought there was a lot more to this than just simply money. My final thought on it is if population trends continue as they are, whilst there will need to be reform in schools and many of the things people have argued for, unavoidably, I'm afraid, it's going to need a lot more money, as are all our public services. Our population is rising by half a million every single year. Well, you've been listening to The Nigel Farage Show here on LBC. I'm back tomorrow at 7.30, because at 7 o'clock, Nick Ferrari will be here interviewing the Prime Minister live. I'll be looking for your, for your reactions. Coming up at 10, it's Ian Collins, but up next, it's Clive Bull. Nigel, thank you. So senior politicians today from right across the political spectrum have signed an open letter to Jeremy Corbyn.